What's up, Ego Hackers? It's C.S. Joseph with csjoseph.life. Doing another episode for Season 21. Probably the dopest episode of Season 21. Do you know why? Because it's like literally how to social engineer INTJs. You know, the type that, uh, the archetype, according to Jungian, depth psychology, Jungian analytical psychology. Well, the archetype that most people maintain is unsocial engineerable. And, well, quite frankly... They'd be right about that most of the time. But don't worry, folks. Everyone's ego is hackable. Everyone is social engineerable. No one is weak against manipulation. And do not forget, all manipulation or all social interaction is a form of manipulation. Do not forget that. So, how to social engineer INTJs. Season 21, episode 12, I believe. At least I think it's episode 12. It should be episode 12. Uh, We're going to be diving into uh, a little bit of INJ-ness and uh, how to social engineer uh, INTJs. So let's talk about, like, why most people think they're unsocial engineerable. Don't forget, uh, the virtue and vice of the INTJ is, uh, well, it's paranoia versus, you know, being trusting. Uh, INTJs can be the most trusting of all the types, often to the point where they can almost be gullible, right? And it's that gullibility. Because the thing is, is as soon as they decide that they trust somebody, that's like, that's it. Like, they trust them. They trust that person, like, with everything. All the secrets, everything. There is an absolute total uh, abundance of, you know, anything goes uh, in that friendship or that relationship, etc. And uh, it's just something very important to the INTJ, you know, throughout, uh, within the context of their relationship, right? So, based on that, you can know with confidence that, you know, if you're in a friendship or relationship with the INTJ and they do trust you, they absolutely do trust you. There is no black and white there, right? Except for when their paranoia gets in play, which is their vice. And their paranoia usually develops because, if you guys remember from season, uh, I think it's season seven uh, playlist here on the YouTube channel and on the podcast. In season seven, we talk about their virtue and vice, but just to kind of a little bit of a refresher, why, why are INTJs paranoid? It's because at the very early stages of their life, they basically are, will believe anyone. They'll believe anything that anyone tells them, and they're extremely gullible. And they learn that over time, people lie to them. And because they're being lied to, that that paranoia develops. Now, that paranoia can be a healthy amount of paranoia, but then that paranoia can be unhealthy, right? There's a lot of examples of healthy paranoia and unhealthy paranoia. But really, remember, the vice that exists for each person can be a good thing. And as much as the virtue for every person can be a bad thing, okay? So, like, for example, the virtue of an INTJ being so overly trusting to someone can lead to gullibility, and that's a bad thing. But then the vice of paranoia, while it can protect them and keep them out of danger, uh, it can also lead to self-fulfilling prophecies that end up destroying friendships or relationships, etc., uh, on a consistent basis, and can contribute to the lack of growth uh, that they have as human beings um, for the rest of their uh, for the rest of their lives, basically. And it's this level of personal growth, this balance between who to trust and who to be paranoid about is really like what separates the men from the boys or the mature versus the immature of people who have the INTJ archetype, which is very interesting because, I mean, if you think about it, the INTJ archetype, like it's one of the most rare on this planet, 1% of the population between men and women, with women being like even rarer among the INTJs out there. INTJ women are pretty rare. It's probably like less than, I don't know, one for every 400 people on the planet, I would say, uh, statistically speaking, um, based on various encounters that I've had with INTJ women, but, you know, definitely not. So another reason people think INTJ, well, okay, so, sorry, let's get back on track here. So paranoia, um, because of their level of paranoia as their vice and how it usually protects them, it usually saves the INTJ from being social engineered or manipulated or ego hacked, basically. And that's great. And because of how paranoid INTJs get, it's extremely hard to manipulate them. It's extremely hard to put one over on them to the point where it's an extreme amount of effort that has to go into actually doing it. Uh, an extreme amount of effort. 
and uh, it's, it's a lot of effort. Uh, like the, the amount of try hard that goes into manipulating or social engineering an INTJ is just absolute pure insanity in some cases due to the levels that the hoops, the amount of hoops that INTJs force people to go through is absolute insanity. Uh, like, for example, I was in a relationship with an INTJ woman recently, and the amount of hoops that she had me go in were just absolutely daunting, you know, and it's just like, yeah, no, it's not a good idea, so, you know, among other things, you know, that the relationship ultimately ended, and, uh, and you know, and, and I moved on, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, it's just that SE inferior insecurity, I need to see consistency, etc. Well, being consistent over a huge period of time, well, that can actually lead to being, you know, very difficult for people, uh, especially, you know, people who are intending on having relationships with INTJs. And, you know, if they have bad experiences with people, their SI demon <coughs> is permanently, uh, is permanently etched on their SI demon and they just can't, they just can't help but remember all the times they've ever been screwed. And guess what? INTJs are extremely guilty of, uh, very guilty of projecting their past relationships onto other people because they start comparing their past relationships with other people, past friendships as well, with other people on a consistent basis. It's really annoying that they do this and I absolutely hate it when they do this and they get hypocritical about it because then they get all mad when, you know, when the person that they're with is doing like talking about their past experiences and then they accuse the other person of projecting their past relationships onto them. It's so funny to me. And they're very hypocritical about it. it like, it's, 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 it's really annoying, actually. Um, but they do this, and they do this because of their paranoia. So anyway, it's extremely difficult to social engineer INTJs due to their paranoia vice because it exists to protect them from being ego hacked or social engineered or manipulated even though they are often manipulated on a regular basis. An INTJ, for example, is not immune to advertising, right? They're not immune to being coaxed into doing impulse decisions or impulse buying, etc. They are not immune to that. That can happen, right? So they definitely are open to manipulation and social engineering, just like anyone is. The difference is, is that you have to be willing to go for their pressure points mentally. And the problem is, though, the difficulty is, is that their pressure points, it's extremely high effort, right? It's almost like you're climbing a mountain with them every single time. But it is possible. It is doable. It is achievable. You know, it just takes an insane amount of endurance to actually achieve and, you know, uh, to complete the con of an INTJ. It's extremely, extremely, uh, you know, difficult. Another thing about INTJs is that INTJs themselves are can be amazing con artists in the same way that an ENTP or an ENFP or an INFJ could be amazing con artists. Those types, in my opinion, are the best at being con artists, those four types, with the INTJ being potentially second best or third best, depending. I mean, you can argue that the ENFP is second best um, or you know, you can argue that the INTJ is second best, but it just really depends. Like, which application of con artistry are we talking here? A good example, probably the greatest INTJ con artist in history is a, a man by the name of Frank Abagnale. There's a movie about him called Catch Me If You Can. And uh, it's basically how the INTJ manipulates things is that they take advantage of systems, right? Systems, uh, and then the, the people who adhere to those systems and they, they lord those systems over other people. The, I was actually uh, watching recently um, a, a video about Frank Abagnale. And uh, Frank, uh, Frank was delivering this lecture in this uh, series of YouTube videos about him, talking about how he would manipulate the systems of various people to become like a, an airline pilot. And he just utilized their system because their system was hackable, basically. And I mean, like, the systems, procedures, I mean, how he acquired a... Uh, an actual bona fide uh, 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 suit that they that the pilots use when they're piloting aircraft, etc., and how he got the number of an account number of a particular pilot and basically assumed the role of that person, and then he became a pilot for the day, basically, and uh, co-piloted a plane with somebody, and then he learned how to pilot an aircraft just by observing, etc., and then that became his skill. 
You could literally go anywhere, essentially. And uh, it was a very interesting social engineering attempt and watching his social engineering attacks and he explained his social engineering attacks by, man by manipulating systems around people, right? Whereas, you know, I'm an ENTP. I don't necessarily manipulate systems. I can't do it because I have INTJ shadow, but I primarily manipulate the hearts, hearts of others, you know, manipulate their heart. Whereas, you know, the INTJ manipulates the mind of other people. So that's why they're called the master mind. They, ma they mastermind people by inserting thoughts or changing thoughts or processes in order to get what they want, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's just kind of their style of social engineering that they actually do or prefer, such as the way that how to social engineer ENTPs with emulated INTJ. That's what happens. And you guys can watch that episode already. Um, so anyway, uh, and like how that develops Stockholm Syndrome uh, within the ENTP. But INTJs, they're a little different. And like I said, it costs a lot of effort, a lot of long suffering, and a lot of endurance because with an INTJ, it's not about the short con. Although some short cons are possible, for example, with getting them to make an impulsive decision. But uh, for the most part, if you really want to social engineer an INTJ, it's all about the long con. The long con is everything. Long con is uh, is what you have to do. Always be prepared for the long con when it comes to uh, uh, INTJs. Because they see you so far in the future, so you better be able to see further than they can in their future, basically. What you can do with Expert Intuition Hero, it is possible uh, to actually see in that direction. Because when NE Hero is around NI Hero, any hero can absorb NI Hero and see as far as NI Hero sees, basically. Along, alongside each other. So it is possible for any hero to provide that futuristic fate manipulation and manipulate the fate or the future of an INTJ such that the long con is complete, right? And that's basically how you con an INTJ. You do it by emulating ENTP, right? And I'm an ENTP, so this lecture is going to be really interesting because this gets to talk about a little bit more about my social engineering style and my seductive style when it comes to, you know, uh, doing performing a long con on an INTJ for whatever point or purpose, right? So uh, remember, it's, it's extremely high effort. It's all about the long con. And if you want to find out examples of, you know, INTJ con artist Frank Abagnale, uh, as played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie Catch Me If You Can, it's an exceptional INTJ uh, story. For those of you that don't maintain that he's an INTJ, you're out of your mind. Uh, he is. Just watch his lectures. That ESFB subconscious comes out, makes tons of jokes and whatnot. He's an excellent public speaker uh, in the same way that Rush Limbaugh is an excellent public speaker. Not that I like Rush Limbaugh, but the guy is an INTJ. So, you know. But anyway, uh, just to, you know, give you guys, you know, an opportunity to, to make comparisons and see how they work, you know. Uh, from a con artist point of view. Watch the film, watch Frank Abagnale's lectures. I think it would be very enriching for this audience to do. So uh, with that in mind, um, we already talked about trusty versus paranoia. Don't forget the interaction style. They're direct, uh, they're responding, their movement. This makes them a finisher type. INTJs procrastinate a lot. Procrastination is one of their biggest issues because they just don't know where to start, but they know where to finish. So you gotta force them to start something so that they know how to finish it appropriately. Uh, that's why, you know, when you're dealing with an INTJ, if you really wanna set them up for failure, you can take advantage of their procrastination. This is one thing that you can do, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but uh, knowing that an INTJ procrastinates, you can pile on a bunch of work on them at the last minute. Uh, and, th and then they'll fail because of that. And then you can destroy their reputation with that failure in front of their fellow coworkers. And then they'll, it'll ultimately lead to them getting fired. And then you don't have to deal with them anymore. That's one of the best ways to defeat uh, an INTJ within their career. You just set them up for failure by taking advantage of the fact that they procrastinate. Otherwise, to bet proper manage an INTJ, what you need to do uh, to prevent that from happening on the other side of the coin is realize they have a propensity for procrastination. So what you do is you give them small amounts of work with shorter deadlines and just a bunch of deadlines with a bunch of mini tasks per deadline spread out over time instead of having them do a bunch of work all at the last minute with one singular deadline and a bunch of work and different tasks all due on the same deadline, essentially. 
because if you do it the other way, that's setting them up for failure and then they will fail and their quality of work will go down, whereas their quality of work stays high if they have one task, one deadline uh, spread out amongst multiple tasks and multiple deadlines over time. So just from a professional management point of view, great. But if you're like a coworker and you don't like an INTJ and you want to make them fail and you have some kind of power or you can influence others to pile up work on them before a big deadline, pile up, find ways to pile up as much work as you can on them before a deadline or maybe create a situation that only they can solve because they're usually selfish with, with their FI child about only things they can solve because they're so focused on their self-importance, et cetera, within the workplace. And when they're so focused on their self-importance, right, they usually have certain things in the workplace that they themselves are responsible for because that's their domain, et cetera. So go influence that one thing to break at the last minute, causing them to fail on their uh, on their deadline and just do it over and over and over again. And then point out their failures to the coworkers to destroy their TE reputation. And then they get fired and then you don't have to deal with them anymore. You see what I'm saying? That's how you can get rid of INTJs. It's very nice. Just burn them that way. And then you won't have them in their life, in your life anymore because of how, you know, pretentious they can get or how self-important they can get or how irreplaceable they can feel, etc. So yeah, just understand that. There's ways to take them down just like there's ways to take down everybody. And that's one way to do the takedown for an INTJ. Set them up for failure and then let them fail. Like there's no type out there other than an INTJ and even INFJ that you can just give them the rope to hang themselves and they don't even realize they're doing it, right? And that's how you perform the long con with the INTJ. You just give them rope to hang themselves, give them the opportunity to fail and they will fail because they're human even though like INFJs, the INTJ is so focused on being perfect at all times and how dare we get in the way of their perfection that they barely become aware of their imperfections at times, at least the prideful, more immature INTJs do this, except the more humble and more mature INTJs out there do not do this, right? But if you have an immature INTJ on your hand, well, I mean, it might be your social obligation and or duty to do this to them so that they learn a very valuable lesson, right? And then you set them up for failure and then they fail and then you expose their failure and then they get fired and then you don't have to deal with them anymore and they have just learned a very big valuable lesson about their life. Maybe they shouldn't be procrastinating all the time, right? I mean... If you have an INTJ child who's currently getting educated or in some kind of educational institution, guess what? Procrastination is their bane of their existence. And you can easily take advantage of that at any time, very easily. Take advantage of their procrastinative uh, tendencies and destroy their career if you decide to. You see what I'm saying? Again, even INTJs are weak to uh, and are subject to manipulation. Because the thing is, while you may not necessarily be manipulating them, you could be manipulating the system that they are adhering to or the people around them that could cause them to fail. You see what I'm saying? It's just really a causation of failure, right? So yeah, they're direct responding movement, they're finisher types, and remember procrastination is a problem with finisher types. It's especially bad with INTJs because that FI child is like, oh, I'm not in the mood to do this right now. And you can take advantage of their mood because FI is all about mood, and I don't care about how this audience is like, no, FI is not about mood. Actually, it really is about mood. Sorry, that's where a person's mood exists as much as it's where their morals exist and their moral principles exist and their moral fiber and their good or bad decision making. Well, guess what? It's also where their mood exists. You know, I don't know how many times ever heard an ESFP FI parent or an ENFP FI parent be like, oh, I'm not in the mood to have sex right now. I'm just not in the mood for it. And like, okay, FI parent. Okay, you're not in the mood for it. Okay, bye. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like things like that, right? Mood. Because uh, FI users are all about their mood and how they feel about things. If they don't feel good about something or if they look bad, God forbid, they look bad. You see what I'm saying? Like, Sometimes in order to motivate an FI user, you just got to make them look bad. You know what I'm saying? And then they're motivated to change only after you've made them look bad. And quite honestly, when you make someone look bad, that is the equivalent of shaming. And sometimes you just got to be willing to shame people for the sake of changing them for the better. Because until you've shamed them, they will not change. Right? So be advised. That's a thing. 
So, uh, pragmatic, they are pragmatic, they're all very independent, they just do what they want, and that's fine if you take away their freedom of choice, if you take away their ability uh, to want things, that's not exactly a very good uh, situation for them as well. And they're very systematic, they always have a process or have a system to follow in some capacity, and they are abstract, all about the what if. Constantly about the what if, like, <clears throat> what if you're going to cheat on me? What if you're going to screw me over later? Uh, what if you're talking to this person? Does that mean that you're going to start dating them and then you'll be cheating on me? What if this happens? What if that happens? You know, uh, what if I get this new job? You know, are you still going to want me around? Uh, what if I? <coughs> there's, they just constantly. What if I? 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 And I? And I? And I? What if I? What if I? What if I? At all times, right? This is the INTJ way. It's because they are abstract, they're systematic, they're pragmatic, which means they are an NT, a.k.a. the intellectuals, right? And if anyone says rationals, take that Kiersey crap and throw it in the dumpster. Rational, let me tell you something. ENTPs who are NTs and INTPs who are also NTs, they're not rational. They're actually logical because only NTJs are rational because of TE, because that's where a person's rationale exists. So stop calling the NTs rationals, people. Like, seriously, stop calling them that. They're intellectuals. And stop mixing the word intellectual with the word academic. Like, seriously, get your definitions straight. They're different. They're not the same, okay? So just because you're some NFP or some STJ who's very academic, it does not make you an intellectual. Being an intellectual is an NT. Sorry, that's not for you guys. You guys can be academics. We'll be the intellectuals, okay? So, now, incoming criticism for being self-important here on the lecture for C.S. Joseph. No, I'm just trying to be accurate with terms. And if you guys feel bad about that, well, I'm sorry. It's not my fault that the truth is taking you down a notch. It's not about that. That's you making that choice. It is not me making that choice. I'm just trying to stay accurate, okay? Because I'd rather be correct than become like some emotionally manipulative person who's just trying to make you feel good instead of telling you the truth. When telling you the truth is what you need to hear so that you can grow up and change. See what I'm saying? And be like a better person. That's what I need. I need criticism consistently on a regular basis. And without criticism, well, guys, it's not going to work out. I need criticism. So keep the criticism coming, if you know what I'm saying. Keep it coming, right? Gosh, I love driving on this road. This road is uh, Highway 20. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, lots of windy road. Got some rain going. There's Sometimes there's cows in the road, which is, also gets a little interesting. I actually had that one time. I almost had a head-on collision with a cow once. That was fun. Um, called 911 on that. There's also some boulders every now and then that show up as well, uh, especially when it rains, mudslides. Uh, also, like two years ago, the entire countryside was black because it was burnt down burnt like a crisp and I think that like 17 firefighters lost their lives uh, during that as well that was pretty sad but I'm very thankful for um, all of the uh, firefighters that risk their lives on a, a regular basis and likely a lot of them are SPs and SJs who do put their lives on the line to do that and I would might add the majority of those people are men risking their lives just saying you know for all of those like feminist anti-feminist people out there like, let's not, let's not spit on our firefighters, please. I actually, like, really appreciate them and the sacrifice that they're willing to make to uh, keep everybody safe and safe homes and whatnot and not displace families. So, anyway, fire sucks and uh, can definitely uh, risk people's lives. So, anyway, uh, I'm going to turn up the heat here just a little bit. Get some defrost going so I don't, like, not do anything incorrect uh, here. So, anyway... Let's talk about uh, the actual techniques necessary to social engineer an INTJ. And you do that by emulating ENTP. So emulated ENTP, you emulate my type. And you know what's really interesting about the ENTP? With that ISFJ subconscious, no one else is willing to long suffer more than an aspirational ISFJ. FJ subconscious. What that means is that the ENTP has the endurance to pull off the long con when it comes to an INTJ. Oh, and for all of those INTJs who are watching, oh gosh, let me tell you something. I really hate this constant criticism that I get from INTJs. I really, really hate it. Like, they're like, 
Like, especially, like, when I'm trying to, like, when I'm getting into, like, a, with a relationship, for example, with an INTJ woman. I just got to say to all the INTJ women watching this right now, it's like, oh, you're like this social engineer and you read all these pickup artist books and you, you know, you're so manipulative and it's all about narrative and is there anything about you that's real? You know what I'm saying? Because they're talking about my, my ins- insincerity, um advice you know and that's because you know people typically they don't understand me and I can't just be real with people if I am 100% real with somebody they're going to hate me that's why I have to wear a mask with everyone I'm around I don't wear masks with INTJs especially like you know if I'm in a relationship with an INTJ woman in my life you know and uh, which you know having that opportunity is fantastic the mask comes off because then it's like okay I could trust her and I could trust her to put up with the real me and see and see the real me right but the thing is typically with people I don't do that which leads to like all these habits like social engineering and embellishment and lying right and being insincere with people right because guess what folks that's what I do and I do that because I have to protect myself, right? And then, you know, of course, if I'm trying to get in a relationship with an INTJ woman, right? Uh, or even, or any INJ for that matter, I still have to get over the same kind of um, uh, obstacle, you know, with an INFJ as well. Because they have, you know, similar paranoia tendencies because of their expert intuition nemesis. But based on that... It's like they come to know that I know Jungian analytical psychology. I know depth psychology. I know ego hacking. I know social engineering. I have all the pickup artist books read, for example. Like that, like I'm this person, right? I'm an, a very capable social engineer. I've even demonstrated social engineering in front of them just to see how easy it is to ego hack somebody like that and literally reduce a grown man to tears, tears of joy. I've done this, right? Uh, and, and had these examples of behavior, right? Well, in doing so, uh, it's like, okay, well, how can that INTJ ever use that virtue of trust in my direction? You see what I'm saying? Like, how can they? How can they trust me, the ENTP, especially like, and no offense when I'm saying it's not trying to be arrogant. I very well could be the world's foremost expert on this, uh, on this subject matter, especially on social engineering ego hacking in this capacity. I'm not talking like the Kevin J. Bitnick version of social engineering, which, by the way, if you have not read The Art of Deception or The Art of uh, Intrusion, what are you doing with your life? And also read Ghost in the Wires while you're at it. Like, literally, every book that Kevin J. Bitnick, he's an INTP, ever wrote, you need to read those books. And Art of Deception and Art of Intrusion are actually social engineering textbooks. They're actual textbooks. Read that. Understand it. Protect yourself, folks. Protect yourself. Because social engineers are out there and there's people out there like me who have these skills and they can ego hack anyone and get into any system because guess what, folks? People are way easier to hack than systems. Way easier. People used to pick locks and be contortionists and, you know, an escape artist, but guess what? You know, good luck. Uh, you know, some of those are pretty ironclad. You ain't gonna be able to get out. But the people who have the keys... Hacking them to give you the keys is way easier than hacking the system and trying to get out some other way, right? Anyway, the point is, is like, I have to deal with the fact that when I get into relationships, you know, especially with the INTJ women, they're like, you have all these skills, how do I know that you're not trying to manipulate me? And it's like this endless thing, and it's so annoying, and I hate it. Like, I really hate it. But it happens with every single one of them, and I, rec- and I recognize that because of their paranoia, it comes with the territory. And then in a healthy relationship, I realize that because of the ENTP long-suffering of SI aspirational... I can get through it, I can put up with it, I can endure the paranoia such that then they realize that I have a pattern of consistent, trustworthy behavior, and then they're willing to trust me, and then they stop behaving that way. But let me tell you, folks, it is the most annoying thing in the world, right? So, guess what? And it's been that way with every single relationship I've ever had with an INJ. Every single one of them. It's always been a point of discussion. And I'll admit... It also was a point of discussion with the ENTJ I was with as well. But just from a relationship standpoint, it is a concern. It is an issue. It's also like, you know, it's like, you know, I break things down to cognitive functions a lot. And guess what? Well, that's just my life. You know, I am the science. Like, that's how much it's permeated me, right? So anyway, why am I, why is this relevant? It's relevant because it's an example of the long suffering required to actually pull off the long con when it comes to an INTJ, right? 
And, you know, I guess what? I even recognize that this particular lecture is potentially going to, you know, cause me drama when I'm conversing with INTJs in my life forever and ever. But guess what? It is what it is. I'm here to tell the truth. I don't care how people feel about it, least of all the INTJs, because I'm here to tell the truth. Everyone could be ego hacked. We need to understand the methodology of the ego hacking right here and now, right? So that's what we're doing. So how do we pull this off? Remember folks, how do you social engineer anyone? What is the various, what is the ironclad surefire method in social engineering somebody? Well, it, you have to do it and you break it down in terms of cognitive functions, right? You have the hero and it's on an axis with the inferior. So what affects one affects the other. The parent function is on the axis with the child. What affects one affects the other, right? That's how it works. That's how we know it works, right? So if they're all on, if they're all affecting each other with one what affects each other, then you have to be aware of optimism versus pessimism, which means some functions have a positive charge and a negative charge, right? The ones that have a positive charge, aka optimistic, is the hero and the child, because when the mind is first developed, the hero and the child actually develops first. It's the parent and the inferior function that develop later because they're pessimistic functions. They're very skeptical. When you're social engineering someone, their skepticism is that boundary, is that obstacle that you have to overcome, right? It's exactly what you have to overcome, you know? Gosh, speaking about doing YouTube videos and causing difficulties in relationships, when I was with that ENFJ for four years, for example, I did my uh, season seven virtue advice, the ENTP lecture, and she watched it, and I talked about sincerity versus insincerity, you know, and the uh, ENTP propensity for lying, and then she thought I'd been lying to her for like the previous three years of our relationship the entire time, and that turned into a huge drama bomb. I grow so tired of having to explain myself over and over and over to my friends and my family and my relationships about this science. Like, I'm here to tell the truth, folks. Just don't assume that that's what I'm trying to do to you. Like, seriously, someone's got to be here to talk about this. Like, stop trying to blame me. Like, it's not about that. You just got to understand that doing my duty here, I'm doing my work for the greater good. You know, in the same way that Gellert Grindelwald in the recent uh, film Fantastic Beasts 2, Crimes of Grindelwald, he gave his speech before all of the wizards and said, uh, uh, you know, it's for the greater good. That's what I'm doing here, folks. The ends justify the means. This is for the greater good. And let me tell you something. With the very super powerful INTJs that exist in the world who have made the world a worse place and not a better place, they need to be ego hacked for the greater good. So I'm teaching you the method so that you can do that right now. See what I'm saying? All the Henry Kissingers of the world, eat your heart out. See what I'm saying? Because, folks, you never ever let a crisis go to waste. So, anyway. Because they're a mastermind doesn't mean that their mind cannot be mastered. So, Remember, pessimistic functions, parent and inferior versus optimistic functions, you really want to make sure that the pessimistic functions are on your side. If the pessimistic functions on your side, the social engineering attack is complete and you've basically completed your objectives and the person will eventually do what you want them to do and you will get the desired outcome after the social engineering attack. How do you pull this off? Okay, well, Avoid the pessimistic functions. So remember, uh, although expert intuition nemesis is a um, an optimistic function, the critic is like a uh, is a pessimistic function because it's in the shadow. The shadow already itself is pessimistic. So you think about it this way: the hero is plus plus because you have the optimistic ego and an optimistic function, so it's plus plus. But the parent is plus minus because it's in an optimistic uh, side of the mind, which is the ego, but it's minus because it is a pessimistic function. When you go into the unconscious side, aka the shadow, it's a little different. You have the, pessimi you have the uh, uh, pessimistic uh, side of the mind with an optimistic function like the nemesis, so it's minus plus, right? And then you have minus minus for the critic, which means you gotta be careful the critic because that double minus critic, it will destroy you. It will absolutely own you if you are not careful because it's a minus minus function. It's the same with everybody, right? So how do you deal with that? Well, I really hope I can finish this lecture on time because I'm running out of battery power here, but let's keep going. 
So, uh, so just be aware of, you know, in order to get the functions on your side and when you're ego hacking them, you want to avoid the pessimistic functions because the pessimistic functions are very skeptical of your intentions or what you're doing and they will find you out if you have uh, evil intentions towards anyone, basically. So you want to focus on making the hero and the child very, very happy, right? So how do you do this? Well, you emulate ENTP. Why do you want to emulate ENTP? Because ENTP is basically the golden pair type of the INTJ. The ENTP can read INTJs like a book. And guess what? INTJs can read ENTPs like a book. But as long as intentions are being properly concealed, and let's say that the ENTP is following the 48 laws of power and the 33 strategies of war and the art of seduction, as well as mastery and the 50th law and the laws of human nature, all of those books by Robert Greene. And if you haven't read them yet, what the hell are you doing with your life? Please get that handled. Please, folks, read Robert Greene, every book he ever wrote. It is worth it. I promise you. So it's like like the ultimate written documentaries of all time about power and intrigue and, and, and seduction. It's super, super mega important. Make sure you're doing it, right? So again, these functions, you got to watch out. Pessimistic, optimistic, very important, right? So as the NTP, you will want to target the hero function and the child function first. Once you get the hero function on your side, the inferior function is no longer insecure. And then once you get the... Uh, uh, um, once you get the child function on your side, the parent function is on your side as well, just by default. Because if you are demonstrating to the parent that you're able to keep their, take care of their inner child, then the parent will be like, okay, well, this person is responsible with my child. We're good to go. No need to worry about it, right? Well, that's the thing about FI child. It's one of the easiest things to hack because what is FI child all about? Because it's optimistic and it's a child. It's like a little kid. Guess what? The INTJ sense of self-importance is super high to the point where they get mega pretentious, they get mega selfish, they can get mega lazy, they can get mega moody. And as long as you seek to make them look good and feel good about how their performance is going and how, uh, you know, and, and increasing their status and their self-importance, etc., well, then the INTJ will literally be eating out of your hands, right? When you start... Like, for example, if you can elevate their life and elevate their status and introduce them to important people so that they themselves feel more important because you're introducing them to important people, haha, <laughs> you got them. See what I'm saying? Like, status. And a lot of TE parents watching this are like, I don't care about status and credentials that much. Bullshit. Actually, your actions say otherwise. All of you are like trying to go get that one credential that you need to get to that one level. And I know that you focus on that one credential, but for some reason you guys maintain that uh, getting that one thing instead of actually being, having mastery on a subject, complete mastery on a particular subject, where you like to, you know, <laughs> daisy pick or cherry pick with your NI hero and focus on that one thing that I want. You read a book, you only read the chapters that are relevant to you and you move on to the next thing instead of actually mastering the entire subject. No wonder you lose skills because you don't use them. See what I'm saying? Because INTJs, guess what? They get too lazy with trying to master that one thing unless it's absolutely important FI child to them. Remember, you can always appeal to the self-importance of an INTJ to get the parent on their side. You know, and uh, to get the inferior on the side, all you have to do is give them choices. Let them do what they want. Guess what? How do you do that? Well, you perform a Xanatos Gambit. The Xanatos Gambit, because it's an I-Hero, guess what? This is where the long con comes in. The Xanatos Gambit takes a huge amount of effort because that anti hero can last a long time. And the Xanatos Gambit is just... You provide them choices. That's all it is. You provide an I hero with a lot of different choices and you let them pick the choice. The thing is, is at the end of the day, whatever choices that you provide them, those choices benefit you in the end. That's known as the Xanatos Gambit. X-A-N-A-T-O-S Gambit. Look it up. Xanatos Gambit. You perform a Xanatos Gambit on the INTJ and their NI hero thinks they always have a choice, but then they always end up choosing the choice that benefits you in the end. It may look like to them that it benefits them right now in the moment. Ooh, wait, that's another thing you can take advantage of because they live in the moment with their expert at sensing. Sometimes they're not always aware of the external consequences of their actions because they're so focused on the moment that it makes it a lot easier for you to perform a Xanatos Gambit on the INTJ because that's how you get them to break that impulsive behavior. And that's why INTJs can be weak to certain forms of advertising because it applies, it, it actually uh, directly applies to 
performing a Xanatos Gambit. That's why there's certain uh, email campaigns out there that you send an email to an INTJ and they're like, meh. You send another one, like, okay, meh. Third one, meh. Fourth one, I'm a little interested. Fifth one, a little interested. It just increases their interest and it compounds over time until all of a sudden you've got them and then they make an impulsive decision right there in the moment, right? It's all about slow cooking. So, for example, you throw a frog in hot boiling water, the frog's going to jump out. But if you slowly rise the temperature of the boiling hot water, or the water to a boil in that pot, the frog will die. That is the Xanatos gambit that you are doing to the INTJ. You are slowly turning up the heat, and they don't even realize, because they're acclimating at the same level of the heat rising, they don't realize that the heat has got them and that their life is in danger. They don't even realize it because that is the Xanatos gambit because guess what? They're, they live so much in the moment, they're not even keeping track of their past decisions that they've already made and they don't even see the pattern. They're not even remotely able to see the pattern because their any nemesis is too weak, right? They can't even see the pattern of the decisions that they've made with you leading up to that point because here's the thing. You have uh, you give them a, a pool of decisions, and this is level one, right? You've just given them a pool of decisions. Okay, I choose this one, and that leads to this pool of decisions. Oh, I choose one, and that leads to this pool of decisions. Then I choose that one. This leads to this pool of decisions. I choose that one. That leads to this pool of decisions. And then no matter what decision they make, guess what? They are going to the outcome that you want, slowly narrowing them, almost like a funnel, right? where their NI is being narrowed down into a funnel towards the decision you ultimately want them to take, and you got them. See what I'm saying? The Xanatos Gambit, that's how you defeat an I hero, right? You give them choices and choices and choices and choices so long as those choices ultimately end up benefiting you in the end. And they're not really aware of it because they live so much in the moment. They may get paranoid of it, but because you're consistent with them, well, not so much an issue, right? Well, what's an example of that? So let's talk about scenario because we haven't really talked about scenario and the battery's running out here. So let's talk scenario, a particular scenario where an INTJ would be uh, manipulated, right? So let's see, what is what is a good scenario? Um, well, uh, here's a good scenario. An INTJ uh, being manipulated by an ENTP because the ENTP is trying to get intellectual property from the INTJ based on a true story, right? So. INTJ owned a company, had uh, an algorithm, right? It was a special algorithm. It was an algorithm for blockchain technology uh, that allowed them to basically create a form of hedge fund, right? A form of hedge fund uh, with, uh, with blockchain technology. A fantastic idea. And uh, <clears throat> um, they also, um, and, and if I remember correctly, it wasn't so much of a hedge fund as much as it was also like a bank at the same time. But they had these really interesting proprietary algorithms, and you can't patent an algorithm. They're actually very trade secretable. You can't you can't patent an algorithm. You can't. Uh, trust me, I've tried. Uh, so this INTJ had these uh, you know had these algorithms at this one time, and this ENTP got involved with their company and whatnot. The ENTP was actually hired and working in secret by another company, uh, and this was basically an industrial espionage situation where this ENTP got into this company, and their objective was basically to get a hold of the algorithms between the blockchain technologies so that they could deploy their own banking system, you know, and that was the mission. And the INTJ just needed somebody, you know, to help them out, and guess what? The ENTP was very helpful, right, to that end, right? So the ENTP deployed a Xanatos Gambit while simultaneously uh, appealing to the self-importance of the INTJ so that the INTJ would let their guard down and get to the point where the INTJ virtue of trusting would trust the ENTP absolutely, thinking that the ENTP was 100% diehard loyal to the INTJ such that the INTJ allowed the ENTP access to see the algorithms behind their blockchain technology. And well, the ENTP succeeded in getting access to that information. And once the ENTP had access to the information and transmitted it to the competition, as the ENTP was originally hired to do so, and the ENTP was originally loyal, more loyal to the people that initially hired him instead of the INTJ, uh, Mark, basically, that information made it in the hands of that INTJ's competition and they created a, a competitive company and it ultimately they were able to get first to market and ultimately put out the other INTJ out of business, specifically as a result of theft of those algorithms as a result of performing a social engineering attack, which, guess what, is very hard to prosecute, folks, very hard to prosecute because there's a lot of plausible deniability in there because of a social engineering attack uh, 
produced and provided that subtly. You see what I'm saying? Good luck defending yourself against such social engineering attacks. And good luck proving that in court. Good luck. Industrial espionage is a thing, folks. Here's another thing. You know what's really funny, though? Like, sometimes those social engineering attacks can backfire if the if the ENTP in that situation ends up becoming loyal to the INTJ such that the INTJ effectively turned the ENTP back on the other guys. The ENTP through loyalty with the INTJ actually revealed uh, the industrial espionage and then they turned it around. But then again, the ENTP could end up at that point playing both sides simultaneously to their advantage, which has happened in the story Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, the story about George Smiley. I recommend you read that story. It is absolutely exquisite. Uh, and it talks about social engineering and how a, a covert operative ends up becoming a double agent and playing both sides for his own benefit and or survival, right? Well, that's a situation that can happen there. So just even though when the INTJ thinks that the ENTP spy is loyal to them, that ENTP spy is still playing them. You see what I'm saying? Because they're playing both sides to their own personal benefit. You see what I'm saying? That's a thing too. So INTJs, don't get all smug and confident that you can actually pull that off and make them loyal to you because guess what? They may not still truly be loyal to you at the end of the day, right? Be careful. This stuff happens, right? And remember, people could still emulate ENTP. It doesn't necessarily have to be an ENTP, right? So anyway, the ENTP comes to this INTJ, right? And uh, starts making decisions and demonstrations of loyalty right off the bat to show SI uh, discipline, to show SI loyalty to the SE inferiors. So the SE inferior is not afraid uh, that the ENTP is disloyal, which this makes the NI hero a lot safer, a lot happier. Uh, the NI hero has a higher level of desire for, um, for the ENTP. It makes the ENTP feel wanted as a result. And then the NI hero, and then what that does is that the uh, NE hero of the ENTP is able to uh, deploy the Xanatos Gambit to the NI hero. And that Xanatos Gambit will be pools of choices, uh, little decision trees uh, to the INTJ to ultimately lead the INTJ into giving up those blockchain algorithms for that banking system, right? That investment banking system that they want in the blockchain so that the competition can get that intellectual property specifically to create a competitive solution to the INTJ solution and then be first to market with it such that uh, they end up destroying the INTJ's business, right? That happens. So the NI hero, uh, the NI hero is presented with the Xanatos Gambit from the ENTP, a lot of different decisions. And, and uh, because they don't really keep track or are not keeping track of these decisions because of their SI demon and they just forget because they live so much in the moment as much as they live in the future, they're not paying attention to the past. They're not able to keep track of each decision that they've made if the ENTP is ultimately leading to the ENTP getting those algorithms, their absolute, their final objective, right? That's an issue. So something to be aware of, folks. That is a thing. Be careful, right? Be careful of that. So uh, while simultaneously, after performing the Xanatos Gambit and making those demonstrations of loyalty to get SC Inferior comfortable, to get Anti Hero uh, working on it just fine, that TE Parent is still there and is looking for consistency because TE Parent and SC Inferior is like, okay, is this ENTP person being consistent? Because here's the thing, folks, this is what makes it really hard. If there's a lack of consistency at all, the INTG will be on guard and will not uh, trust the ENTP or the emulated ENTP. You have to be consistent and that consistency may have to take place over weeks and weeks, if not months. But remember, at least the INTJ is a movement type, so it shouldn't take more than a few months, maybe 90 days worth of consistency for the INTJ to find out, okay, this person's consistent, they're trustworthy, I can I could definitely trust them, and then they start opening up with that trust uh, um, uh, virtue instead of that paranoia vice, right? That paranoia vice that's holding back the INTJ in this interaction, okay? So based on that, uh, just more to be aware of. So in order to make the INTJ happier, as a result, the ENTP starts appealing to the self-importance of, uh, of the INTJ. And it's like, hey, you're doing really good work. 
the INTJ overhears the ENTP talking very highly of the INTJ to others, talking about how brilliant the INTJ is and how intelligent they are and how they're very good at what they do and how they perform very well. Whenever you're talking very well about really good performance of an INTJ that makes their ESFP subconscious feel really good about itself, it makes them super happy because the SE inferior doesn't have that performance anxiety anymore. The performance anxiety is lifted. The FI child feels really valued, feels very valuable, very good. The status is increasing amongst the people because it's like, wow, the ENTP thinks very highly of me and is telling other people now everyone's going to start thinking highly of me and that means I could feel good about myself and increase my self-importance. Yay! Which also leads to them being selfish. Just saying. Watch out. And then, uh, and then that just causes the NI hero to desire the ENTP and desire that 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 ENTP to be around them more often. And the ENTP, it's a demonstration of loyalty to speak so highly of the INTJ to others, such that their pride goes up. That FI child pride, and take and and it's just like literally this ego stroke, right? Because what INTJ out there doesn't like their ego stroked, right? And the ENTP knows exactly how to ego stroke the INTJ. The INTJ gets ego stroked. They let their guard down. They don't even, they're not even aware that there's a Xanatos gambit happening. Even though they were a little paranoid at first about the ENTP and the ENTP's intentions. But the ENTP is showing consistency. They're, they're, they're showing that they're loyal. Then the INTJ tests the ENTP, tests the ENTP's loyalty, pushes the ENTP away. But the ENTP keeps coming back almost like a loyal little puppy dog. And the INTJ is like, wow, he keeps coming back, even though I'm kind of being a dick, and he's still speaking highly of me to other people. And I definitely want the ENTP around. This is absolutely fantastic. You know, I definitely can trust this person. This person's all in with me. They're absolutely here, uh, you know, to go all the way. They think so highly of me. I feel really good about them. They know that I'm a top performer. I've been trying to convince these people that I'm a top performer for so long, but they instantly know this about me already, and I'm making them comfortable. Every time I do something for them, they react positive to me. This ENTP is always reacting positive to any experience or anything that I show the ENTP. They think I'm brilliant. They think I'm a good person. You know, I really want them to be around, and they're constantly giving me choices and opportunities for improvement and making things better. And... Uh, you know, I, I just trust this person. I, I trust the ENTP, you know, and, and I want to show him my brilliance even more. I want to show this ENTP just how brilliant I am. So I'm going to show the ENTP my algorithms. <sighs> Social engineering attack complete. So, yeah, it was like my demon coming out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway, uh, that's how that works. All right, folks, let's break it down. Okay, so the ENTP got in there and is like, okay, I need to get the hero on my side. So, and that works both ways, right? You can, if you want to get the hero on your side, well, you can also hit the inferior function too. So they hit the inferior function with a demonstration of loyalty, showing that the, uh, you know, talking really good about the, uh, the performance of the INTJ, stroking their ego with FI child, you know, targeting the self-importance of, of FI child, speaking highly of others, showing, demonstrating through action and word and word and deed that the ENTP thinks highly of the INTJ and the INTJ ultimately lets their guard down as I've just demonstrated to you. Also simultaneously, while any nemesis is there questioning the intentions of the ENTP, the ENTP is actually like, because the ENTP at first will come off as like, you know, whoa, you're like, you're way too into me or you think I'm way too important this is this is too much the people like you just don't exist this never happens to me people don't think highly of me in this way that any nemesis is questioning the intentions of the ENTP at that point but the ENTP is consistent and the ENTP keeps it up and the ENTP doesn't change which causes the INTJ to realize over time the ENTP just might actually be legit this person may actually be really into me and really trust me in this manner wow I've never had that before. Wow, this is something special. Wow, this person might be my best friend or this person might be the best lover I've ever had, right? Those kinds of things, right? Something to be aware of, right? So just understand how things are different, you know, in that regard. Um, any nemesis at first, you know, is ha made happy once SE Inferior realizes how consistent the ENTP social engineer is being in their social engineering attack and thus 
any nemesis lets go because it's still optimistic at the end of the day. Oh, he may not actually have bad intentions towards me after all. And then TI Critic is there to verify everything that the ENTP does and verify that consistency. So as long as the ENTP stays consistent with their narrative and doesn't change their narrative or their story, TI Critic, you won't have to ever deal with the double negative of TI Critic. And then as a result, social engineering attack complete. Don't have to care about the, S the FE trickster and the SI demon, you don't have to care about either because as long as the INTJ is being consistently praised about their top performance and that the ENTP is reacting positively to everything that the INTJ shows them, they're just wowed and they're like, oh, mind blown, I'm so mind blown about what you're showing me, etc. The INTJ's SE Inferior is happy because the SE Inferior is like, wow, I'm obviously performing well. I don't have to be anxious or afraid that I'm not performing well around this ENTP who's a very brilliant person. Sometimes I feel like they're more brilliant than I am, that they're more intelligent than I am, but they think so highly of me. So I'm obviously performing well for them right now. So I can just let my guard down there. I don't have to be afraid of that anymore. And then thus the SE the SI Demon doesn't come out. And then all of a sudden that ENTP is just eventually over time gotten into the soul of the INTJ and literally broken them. You see what I'm saying? Like literally broken them open. You know what I'm saying? And then they get the algorithms. We got the inf algorithms. We got the proprietary information we want for our industrial espionage mission. Social engineering attack complete. So that's how to social engineer INTJs, folks. Watch out. The Xanatos Gambit will ultimately lead the INTJ down a path that they do not want to go, even though they feel it is the path they want to go and they do not have the ability to keep track of those decisions over time because it's their SI demon, which is the long-term memory, and their only short-term memory or the future memory for their own personal unconscious of where they want to go themselves in the future. That's the direction that they are going, right? So watch out for the Xanatos Gambit, watch out for appealing to their self-importance, watch out for appealing to their uh, um, uh, uh, performance, anxiety, etc because those are their weak points. And anyone can do these things and cause the INTJ to all of a sudden give special treatment to people they should not be giving special treatment to. So anyway, folks, that's it for this episode. If you found this episode useful, helpful, educational, enlightening, please subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and also on the podcast. If you would like to financially support us to help us keep the lights on here at CSJ and this community going, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash csjoseph gold tier access for private lectures. We're doing another golden para lecture very soon, which is ESFP ISFJ. And then after that, it will be ENTP INTJ, for example. Make sure you guys are checking that out. Um, also, like, thank you for your financial support. It does help keep the lights on, and uh, we're very happy to be able to do that. We've got a lot more content coming out, uh, and we are going to be working on the test. We just need money to be able to get that test out uh, to get it figured out. Um, also, uh, please, uh, you know, click the little bell thingy, uh, leave a comment and a like while you're at it. Uh, we like those as well. Uh, I read every comment. If you've noticed, I hit the little heart button on all the comments. That basically is me marking them as red. I read your comments, folks. I do it all the time. So just make sure that that's uh, something you're aware of. Um, I do read your comments. I may not respond to everybody. Typically, if you have a question mark, I respond to it. Uh, but if you're just commenting, you know, without a question mark, not necessarily going to answer. And then also, like, uh, you know, you can have your questions for the Q&A. If you want to get on the Q&A, go to csjoseph.life slash social and then go to Discord and then start putting in the questions for Chase Channel. Those questions will be answered on the Discord Q&As, which is every Thursday night at 9. We also have how to type streams on every Tuesday night at 9 Eastern. So anyway, folks. That's it for episode uh, episode 12 for season 21, how to social engineer the types, and this is how to social engineer INTJs. So this is CS Joseph signing out. Have a good day, Eagle Hackers. See you tomorrow. Good night.